That's a lot of times the high school footballer that falls on it in a game. Uh, hockey players crash into each other on the ice. We commonly get that. Any of us that have been around for 30 years or more, and I think most of the audience, with the exception of one young lady there, I think, is uh, in part of this thir over 30 crowd. If we do an x-ray of our shoulder, that joint's going to look arthritic. We don't have to worry about it unless I poke on it and you say, yeah, that's the pain. So that a lot of times people will come with an MRI that says, well, I got this list of eight different things it says is wrong with my shoulder. But how much of that is important? And maybe one or two of those things, that AC joint is typically not one of them. If we think about instability, this is still this 18 to 22 year old kid. So maybe our kids or grandkids that are crashing into people. You can traumatically knock the ball off the golf tee and then end up having to do a repair of the bumper around the socket we call that the labrum. So there's a bumper in the front, there's a bumper in the back. Uh, the ligaments in the shoulder sort of make like a hammock to keep the golf ball on the tee. If you think about sitting in a hammock and what, both sides of your hammock are, are tight, then you sit right in the middle of your hammock and read your book. If one half of your hammock is lax or loose, then you fall out of your hammock the same way all the time. That's what happens when people dislocate their shoulder is they sort of detension half of their hammock. Again, that's probably the high school, college age person who's dislocated their shoulder and may need it to be stabilized. The rest of us, as we mature, tend to have more problems with stiffness than we do with instability of our shoulder. So again, if we come back to the MRI report that says, well, the labrum is torn, this bumper thing. Well, all of us probably have some tearing of our labrum. Part of what I do is translate that to examining someone's shoulder and helping you figure out what do we need to worry about and what can we just say is part of the, part of the normal process of life. People sometimes have heard about this thing called a slap tear, which is an acronym. It stands for superior labrum, anterior to posterior. More uh, neighborhood barbecue trivia, so you can say I learned what a slap was, because you'll hear about some baseball pitcher that had a torn whatever it was and fixed it, and he's on the disabled list, and he's no longer on your fantasy team. A slap tear is something, <coughs> excuse me, that if we look, here's the ball in the socket. These are both MRI pictures. And they put some stuff inside the shoulder joint so we can see the ball from the socket better. But this little bumper here, that's where there's a tear. And here's where there isn't a tear. So we can see this white stuff that goes up underneath the edge of the socket. And if we take the ball away from the socket and look face on at the socket, the glenoid is the socket. The bumper is that labrum there. And this one's torn up at the top. So that's something that uh, more in overhead throwers, uh, the high school, college sport kid, uh, we think about fixing those. But what do we do if we have a torn labor? Those of us, especially people that have do, been do, doing construction, farming, any kind of heavy lifting, you probably have some tearing of it. So I'll see folks and say, well, yeah, your MRI that somebody ordered says you have a torn labor. Well, what do we do? Maybe we modify what we do. Maybe people say, I used to be able to do an overhead lifting, pressing maneuver. I don't do that anymore. I have somebody else do that, or I change my exercise program. That's one way to fix it. Physical therapy, to strengthen those little wimpy muscles, those four most muscles we were talking about before, those keep the ball seated down in the socket. So if we strengthen those muscles, because we start with a sore, excuse me, a sore shoulder that becomes a little deconditioned, and those muscles get a little weaker, we become more sore, kind of get into this spiral. We want to dig out of that spiral and try and do it with the, the, as little invasion of you as possible. Maybe it's just doing a little physical therapy. That's a pretty, uh, pretty low risk kind of a way to get you better. And if we can do it with that, then we're done. If we need to do surgery, these are some pictures of a shoulder at surgery through the fiber optic scope. From perspective, this little end of this metal probe is three and a half millimeters long. So this is all real magnified. That looks like a telephone pole inside somebody's shoulder. But this is a picture of a torn bumper, that labrum that should be attached here. And here's a picture of uh, what somebody did through the fiber optic scope. So it's done with but the incisions that are maybe a quarter to a half an inch long, the instruments are about the size of a ballpoint pen that we use to repair that kind of stuff. And the same instruments are used for rotator cuff repair surgery. This little implant here, Dustin is with a company called Arthrex, and they provide the implants that I happen to use, so he was kind enough to bring some stuff along. So you can look at this. This isn't going to go in anybody. It's a demonstration model. But that's the kind of implant that's probably on the other end of these stitches that you see there. Uh, that can be used to fix torn stuff. And there's a little, if you want to do it at home, he brought the instruction. <laughs> <laughs> Frozen shoulder is something that you can almost think of as stiff, painful shoulder. 
doesn't necessarily have a glamorous story there I was running for the end zone kind of thing most often someone will have a relatively trivial injury let's say I reached into the back seat of my car and just sort of felt this pinch but over time typically days to weeks to a couple months they'll say oh, my shoulder is really sore and it's just becoming more and more stiff it affects about two percent of the population so if there are 50 people in this room we're gonna have somebody that will get a frozen shoulder in their lifetime uh, and really what it is is thickening and inflammation of the shoulder capsule think of it as a water balloon that's around the shoulder so if our water balloon is nice and lax we can raise our arm all the way up and back and can scratch up our back and that kind of thing people with a stiff shoulder or painful shoulder from frozen shoulder they'll try and move it and it won't move very well I'll try and move it and it'll move the same poorly that's kind of by definition this thing called frozen shoulder the great thing is that it typically gets better with physical therapy it gets better with doing nothing. I've met one man in this community who had said he had a frozen shoulder. Somehow he uh, he came in and saw one of the guys that founded the clinic who said, yeah, it'll get better, but it'll take about two years, which is what studies have shown if people do nothing to frozen shoulder. It gets better, but it takes about two years. Must have been the, the most patient man in the world next to Joe, but I suppose. He said, I'm not going to do anything. And he saw a guy at the golf course who said, you should go do something, buddy. He said, nope, they told me it would get better. And he said, two years later, he waved at this guy from the first tee and said, I'm doing fine. <laughs> not sure that I'd wait two years. I'd probably go see our physical therapist and get working on it. But that's just something to be aware of. That's something that doesn't typically require any surgical treatment. In my opinion, it's best managed by the stretching program. That's a lot what people do at home, but also at home with some physical therapy. Rotator cuff problems. I see a lot of people that come into my office and we're talking about things and I may say, well, I think you have this thing called shoulder impingement. And they'll say, time out, doc, what gives? My shoulder pain is the same. It hurts right out here. It's worse when I do stuff overhead or reach or push or pull. Went and saw my family doctor and they said I had tendonitis. And then I saw somebody else and they said I had bursitis. And then somebody else thought it was part of my rotator cuff and now you're telling me it's this thing called shoulder impingement which of you guys is right because my pain hasn't changed the reality is all of these things describe the same thing so you do have some inflammation of the tendon that's what an itis is is an inflammation you can have inflammation of the bursa which is a little lubricating sac to let the muscles slide back and forth um, and, and we as specifically use the term shoulder impingement because a guy named dr near back in about 1972 described this process of pinching of the rotator cuff, pinching of the bursa. It gave people pain when they did stuff overhead. And he identified some issues, like maybe some people have a really big bone spur. Most of the time, the bone spur, we know now, isn't so much the problem, but it can be part of the problem. But again, it gets back to, do you have pinching of your rotator cuff? That's what this impingement thing is. And then as we get into tears, you can either have a partial tear or a full tear. I see a lot of people in the office who are sent from their family doctor, and rightly so, to say that may have a tear kind of within the tendon. So like wear and tear inside that tendon. We, may, we wouldn't be able to see it if we looked at it through the fiber optic scope, but they read the MRI report, it says you have a tear in your rotator cuff. They say, go see the surgeon. And then we figure out, well, do we need to fix it or do we not need to fix it? And if you have a partial tear, it's absolutely appropriate to give it a trial of not doing surgery, so less invasive, less risk for you. If you have a pull, a tear all the way through the tendon, then a lot of times I may meet someone in that first visit say, you know what, we're going to have to fix this at some point. Question is, how stiff is their shoulder? What other things are going on in their life? So do we need to do it right away? Or should we work on getting a little motion back first? <clears throat> but that's where you say, well, how do I know if I have a torn rotator cuff? Typically, when you lift your arm, uh, you can have pain. The pain classically, if I ask people to point at the rotator cuff pain, they use the palm of their hand and point out to the side of their arm and they'll say, it looks, I feel like it should be bruised, but I look at it and it's not. Um, and it's not one finger right there, it's kind of out on the side, it can go all the way down kind of to the elbow. Pain that goes down into your fingers. We worry more about things like a pinched nerve in your neck. Do you have a question yet? Oh, okay. I saw him. Uh, other things, weakness. When you try and raise your arm up, the person that says, I fell and landed on the driveway shovel in snow or whatever, I landed and I can't lift my arm past here. I worry about those folks as far as whether they've torn their rotator cuff or certainly as we become more mature. So folks say over 50 who dislocate their shoulder, pops out of the socket when they have a fall, the docs in the ER have to put it back in. 
when I see them, what I'm worried about is maybe they tore their rotator cuff. And sometimes we'll, in the process of working on getting their motion better, sometimes we'll do other imaging stuff to look for that because we know that that's kind of the risk as we get a little more mature rather than having it pop out again. The grinding sensation stuff doesn't mean you have a torn rotator cuff. It probably means you have some of that impingement or inflammation of the tendon or the bursa. Uh, and it can happen with a fall. Suddenly, you know, I was falling off the big rig and caught myself by that handhold and didn't fall on the ground, but boy, my shoulder was really sore after that. Or it can be gradual and onset. People say, I didn't really do anything, but it just started to get achy. And then we get into this spiral of deconditioning and pain and maybe a little more tearing, or it tears very slowly over time before it gets to the point where people can't raise their arm up. So what do we do? We typically start at the conservative end of the buffet. Physical therapy, stretching to get the motion back, strengthening of these little wimpy muscles. So your free weight for strengthening your rotator cuff might be about the size of these cans of pop that are pretty small cans. So a can of tomato soup's about 10 ounces, tuna fish is about four ounces. More than about two pounds is way too much for any of our rotator cuffs. And in fact, the major league baseball pitchers who haven't torn their rotator cuff and don't want to, when they're working on their rotator cuff on their off days from pitching, they use about a two pound weight. So it's key to have this be a low resistance, high repetition exercise when we're doing these strengthening things that the therapist would show us. Um, and that's where these stretchy rubber bands called TheraBands sometimes, sometimes come into play. Medications, so Tylenol is probably the safest, anti-inflammatory medicines, Motrin to leave, that kind of thing. Can be a little hard on our stomach if used for a long period of time. Uh, can give us kidney troubles, or if we have kidney troubles, we need to be aware of that. Uh, kind of a, of a risk when we're using anti-inflammatory medicines. And sometimes we'll use injections. So numbing medicine with cortisone in the same shot as a diagnostic tool. So if I numb up some spot and you say, wow, my pain is gone, then we know where your pain's coming from. If I numb up that spot and you say, my pain really isn't any better, then we know it's not coming from what I just numbed up. So maybe it's a pinched nerve in your neck as an example. So the injections part, is designed to help us figure out where the pain's coming from. The cortisone can calm inflammation in a more precision guided way and allow you to be more comfortable doing the exercises that the therapist would, uh, would show you how to do. And then surgery, as much as I like doing surgery, I only like doing it if we need to. So let's avoid it if we can. If we can avoid it, then surgery can be very successful in helping people get back to their level of function. So who needs surgery? About 90% of people with this thing called shoulder impingement that we'll use as our generic, my rotator cuff's a little deconditioned and irritated. 90% of people, we can get better without doing any surgery to them. That's great. Typically involves the therapy stuff that we were just talking about. It typically involves pain without specific weakness, though someone with a sore shoulder will complain of or tell me that they have pain because their shoulder hurts. So for us to sort out is it weak because it's torn all the way off, or is it weak because it's painful? That's part of what we figure out in the office. Uh, again, weakness in raising your arm points toward maybe having a torn rotator cuff. So if we back up and say, well, how do we figure it out? We listen to what things, you know, where is your pain? What causes it to get worse? What makes it better? Did you have an injury? Examining your joint, your shoulder, is really important to it, so I can correlate stuff, especially if someone comes in with an MRI that's been done somewhere that has a list of eight or ten things that are wrong with the shoulder. What I need to do is narrow it down to say, well, what thing is, fits with what you're telling me is the problem? Um, and the imaging stuff helps us figure that out. So we put all those pieces of the puzzle together. And then what if, when would I, should, do, should I do surgery? If Doing the conservative end of the buffet, modifying your activity, doing physical therapy, sometimes injections, sometimes medications. Does it give you enough relief of your pain? Uh, your quality of life is not what you want it to be. Most orthopedic operations aren't life-saving operations, but they're quality of life-saving operations. So the person that comes in and can't raise their arm comes back after surgery and says, boy, I'm back gardening or I'm golfing or whatever uh, is really why we do what we do. And after having a conversation with someone who can kind of walk you through the whole process, I know surgery is going to do one of three things. It's going to either make you better, make you worse, or just make you different. And if it's either going to make you worse or just make you different, don't do it. But if we think that surgery is going to make you better, then it can be a very successful thing. So, and kind of deciding what's best for you. So if we're doing surgery on the rotator cuff, 
sometimes people will say, well, are you going to do one big incision or multiple little incisions? I'm a multiple little incision guy. I have partners who do rotator cuff repairs with a somewhat bigger incision that still can be a very effective way to treat a torn rotator cuff. There are some things, especially really big tears, that I would argue are easier to do through the scope, but that's a little bit surgeon preference. There are some things that I can get to and do through the scope that people that do it with the bigger incision can't get to. Um, but the tendon sticking down to the bone is still the key to healing your rotator cuff that's torn. I've got two different spots here. This is the six week plan and this is the six month plan. Most people would rather have the six week plan. The key to that is what's the problem in your shoulder. So if the rotator cuff isn't fully torn or if it's just pinching from a bone spur or a bursa or some other tissue that gets torn and pinched, then that's basically a, a clean it out kind of a procedure. That means you wear a sling for comfort and you can do as much range of motion of your shoulder as you're comfortable doing. You can get back to activities really much more quickly and that's why I call it the six week plan. If your rotator cuff tendon is torn away from the bone, and I'll show you a picture here of one, then we end up using this stuff. We got some more of Dustin's stuff here. This is just a little foam model, but it's got implants and the stitches that we use for doing rotator cuff repairs, so we can pass those around. There's some cartoons there as well. But if we need to do the six-month plan, that means that that tendon requires repairing, so sticking the tendon back down to the bone, and that's what, again, I prefer to do through the fiber optic scope. These are the actual kinds of implants that we use. Typically, it's three or four incisions that are each quarter to a half an inch long, and the instruments are about the size of a ballpoint pen that we use to do the surgery. It is a same day surgery, so all of this stuff is done as an outpatient. Uh, so you don't have to stay overnight in the hospital. And if we look at what do we do, this is just a picture. We're looking sort of top down bird's eye view of the rotator cuff. And probably the best analogy that I've come up with this is the torn tendon. Hope it didn't gross anybody out, but it's, I think it looks pretty, but that's just me. Yeah. <laughs> if you think of this tendon as being, if you take the middle of your bedspread and you pull it down from the head of the bed, and this is the head of the bed. And what we need to do is take that thing, that's the bedspread, and pull it up where the pillows are. Because we shouldn't, there I did it again. <laughs> we shouldn't be able to see into the ball and socket looking from outside the rotator cuff. So when we can see down, this is the socket. When I can see into the joint, that's a bad sign. That means that this tendon is torn away from the bone. So what we've done here is we put a bunch of stitches back and forth, and then we've taken this tendon and stuck it back down to the bone. So that's the rotator cuff repair when seen through the fiber optic scope. The little model that's being passed around shows the actual sutures and implants, and it doesn't end up looking like a C anemone. We cut the sutures off flush with the little implants that are there in order to take that. Think of it as creating spot wells to stick the tendon back down to the bone. But that's why it's the six month plan of recovery because it takes a long time for that spot well to heal. And whether we do that through the scope or whether we do it with a bigger incision, the healing of that comforter sticking back down to the pillow into your bed hasn't changed in speed. The implants are stronger, the sutures are stronger, but the weakest link in this chain is the patient's own rotator cuff tissue, in part because it tore in the first place. Um, so that that's why we need to go slowly with the rehab. So people end up being in a sling for about the first month, doing some dangling exercises, then we work with physical therapy to get through some of the stiffness. Then at two or three months from surgery, we add some soup can exercises to strengthen it. And when I say it's the six month plan, that's about the time before I say, okay, you can do whatever you want. People still get better even the first year after a rotator cuff surgery. And that's just because there's a lot of reconditioning of the muscles that needs to happen. Especially if we think about a lot of times it took us half a year to get to the point where it was bad enough that we decided to go see somebody and do surgery. It's going to take at least that long to get you back to where you started. And that's where it's kind of the nature of the beast. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in closing, knowing why we have pain is really important. Again, surgery makes you better, worse, or just different. If we do an awesome shoulder operation for a pinched nerve in your neck, we haven't helped you. So that's where somebody like me can help figure out where is the pain coming from. Um, most of these things can be controlled without surgery. Uh, and if those things don't make it better and we've got an option that has a good chance at making you better as opposed to just different or worse, um, then shoulder surgery can be a very effective way to get people back to their level of function. And again, I would just say that 
for folks. Sometimes people will come to these seminars not because they have a sore shoulder, but because they're tired of listening to somebody else talk about their sore shoulder. And it really is true that with shoulder problems, it's something that the longer we stick our head in the sand, it can get worse. So it can become, can be a little bit torn or just a pinched nerve. It could be that six week plan that if we don't get to it, then it becomes the six month plan. So part of what I want to do is try and help educate the public to say, your arthritic knee a lot of times doesn't become any more arthritic the longer you wait. A shoulder problem can become a bigger deal the longer you wait. And sometimes the tear can be not repairable, and then it gets into this whole different world of stuff like shoulder replacements that because we've got multiple talks today, we want to drag it on for an hour and a half as opposed to a half an hour of, of uh, visiting with you. So um, thanks for your attention. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer those. I know Angie's built some question and answer time into the 